Okay, I know we kind of raced through that one, but hopefully that's all making sense. Um, so we'll finish off with, you know, experimental design and our exam study. Again, the study design is really helpful. Um, with this, you just kind of have to fish through it and see what's actually useful, what's not. Most of the important terms are in here. Um, when we get to it, I will talk about reproducibility and repeatability because that's something that's been introduced with this study design. Um, but super, 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 super important. If you haven't done your area of study of three, area of study three sec yet, um, do all of this stuff as soon as you can because it's really important for that sec, but also for your exam. There are always questions on it, um, particularly towards the end of the exam. I want to say towards the end of the exam is when your questions get longer. So that's when you start to get big paragraphs when you start to get lots of multi-part questions and it's sort of where they try or not where they try but where they do tend to bring in a lot of area study theory stuff um i remember when i did bio i hated it i hated it with a passion um yeah that's basically it but you just have to study it and eventually you know you might find a liking for it somewhere i personally didn't really but um it's really important and i think because i hated it I never wanted to study it, but I had to. Otherwise, I would have lost a billion marks. Um, so just be mindful. And I think something as well, I used to tell myself like, oh, you know, I've done this for lots of years. Like I know it really well. It's fine. But you have to work like doing practice questions with it um, so that you have ideas in your head of how Vika will ask questions relating to photosynthesis, relating to cellular respiration, relating to transcription, translation, DNA manipulation, immunology, all that sort of stuff, um, and how they will apply it in that context. You can't just say like, oh, it's an application question, so I'm just going to apply it when I get there. It's an application question, so I need to practice applying it in as many different scenarios as I can, is what your thinking should sort of be. Um, okay, so knowing your variables. So your IV is the thing that you manipulate. Your DV is the thing that is being... Um, measured the whole point of your experiment is to figure out what the effect is of the iv on the dv um your controlled variables are basically any variables that could affect the dv that you obviously don't want to um they need to be kept controlled if you do not control these there is no way of saying the iv has caused this change in the dv because it could be this other variable that you haven't left controlled and then your experiment is useless basically um so your experimental group and your control group very important to distinguish controlled variables from your control group controlled variables are the things that could be the iv just the little variables control group is the whole like setting um so your experimental group is what is exposed to the iv so if you are observing light intensity and its effect on photosynthesis your experimental groups will be um you know i don't know dim light average light bright light your control group will be something in the dark um it's something that is not exposed to the independent variable and it acts as a baseline comparison and it also makes sure that you don't have any confounding variables so you are checking yeah light intensity on photosynthesis you've got your dim light your mid light and then your bright light um and then you know your dim light doesn't grow that much mid light grows a little bit more your bright light grows amazingly if your plant that is in the dark if that grows amazingly you're kind of thinking mm, something's going wrong here right because we're not exposing this to the independent variable so it should serve as a baseline. It should be like a zero, really. Um, or it should, you know, if it grows three centimeters, then you'd expect everything else to grow above three centimeters. Um, it's that idea of that baseline comparison. So that is why the control group is really, really important. And whenever you write about um, a an experimental design, you need to make sure you identify that you have a control group. Um, okay, so your validity and your reliability. Validity is basically, um, is this measuring what it's meant to measure? So you can think about that in terms of equipment or in terms of your experiment. It's, is this experiment, have I designed it in a way that it actually tests the IV and the DV? So I want to check the effect of light intensity on the rate of photosynthesis. 
is my experiment actually set up in a valid way that I am able to like answer the question basically. Um, it's similar to accuracy, but accuracy is basically, um, is this correct? Like, um, my plant has grown by three centimeters. Is this sort of like actually how much, you know, it's grown by, um, has it grown by 30 centimeters and I'm using the world's worst ruler, that sort of idea. Um, reliability is if I repeated the experiment, is the result going to be the same? Precision is, are all my results within a narrow range? Um, in terms of your repeatability and your reproducibility, repeatability is same time, same place. Reproducibility is different time, different person, different place. So your repeatability, again, think of the name of it as well, repeat versus reproduce. If I'm thinking about repeatability, it's if I perform these measurements again in the exact same context, the same person, the same equipment, am I getting the right results? If it's reproducibility, is it if I'm a different person on a different day in a different environment using different equipment, am I getting similar results? So that's what you should think about as well. Um, so having a large sample size, repeating the experiment is really important for your reliability and getting rid of your, um, oh my gosh, your error, your, it'll come up. Yeah, your random errors. That's what I was thinking. I was going to say standard errors. Your random errors. Um, having a large sample size and repeating is really important for that. So random errors are just that. Really random errors, um, you know, sort of like fluctuations in atmospheric pressure, temperature, that sort of thing. Um, it's completely random and it will affect like one random result. Whereas your systematic errors affect every single result consistently. So it's often to do with equipment. So if you've got a measuring thing, like I said, like the world's best ruler, if you've got a ruler and it measures, it's got your one centimeter, two centimeter, three centimeter, but in actuality, each of those centimeters are 1.2 centimeters apart. It's going to create a systematic error because you're using it to measure everything and it's going to be out every single time. Whereas your random error um, would be, yeah, the temperature in the room changed. So, so then, I don't know, the plant wilted or something like that. Um, so that's what you're thinking of there. So, um, be really aware of errors and ways to improve errors and things like that. Um, very, very important. Qualitative and quantitative data. I'm sure you've been bored to death of this sort of thing. Qualitative, quality, descriptive words, subjective. Quantitative, more objective, more numerical. Quantitative data is what you sort of aim for. Qualitative is still very helpful, but quantitative is just a little bit more robust. Um, okay, so... Um, in terms of answering an experimental design question, very different to answer an experimental design question in an exam versus as you would for your like area of study three SAC. Um, so there are a couple of things just to kind of note. Um, so it depends how many marks. Generally, there might be about four marks ish, maybe less. Um, so you just need to be really concise. You're not writing out, when you're writing out a method as well, you're not writing out um, a method as you would in your area of study three SAC where it's like a billion steps long. You're just being really concise and giving a nice overview about your method. Um, so your treatment and your control groups, your, you know, your experiment or your control groups, remember that control group. It's really, really important. Students always forget it. Remember to include a large sample size. Um, remember to be as specific as you can. Dependent and independent variables, your controlled variables, again, listing about three, a sentence or two, a sentence or two, nothing more, nothing less um, about your method. But again, you don't have to go step by step by step by step. This is a four mark question, not a 40 mark question. So really be mindful of that. Um, but at the same time, don't be too brief. You need to give a proper explanation of what you're doing. And lastly, repeating the experiment. Um, talk about this idea of, you know, your reliability or your repeatability, the repeatability, that sort of thing. Um, and talk about how you're minimizing your random errors through that. Hopefully you all said that at the same time. Um, but yeah, random errors are what you're thinking about in terms of repeating that experiment. Because if you think about it, if you have, um, like four measurements, and one of them is affected by a random error that can skew your results based on if you've got 40 measurements. 
um, you know, one in four things being dodgy, that's going to create a bigger effect than one in 40 things. Um, so just be really mindful of that. Okay, we will go through this a little bit. Um, so two researchers have discovered that they did not properly label a bottle containing the enzyme amylase, which catalyzes the breakdown of starch. The amylase could either be amylase from a human or from Thermus aquaticus found in 80 degree hot springs. So devise a test they could conduct on the amylase to determine its source and include in your answer which characteristic of enzymes makes this possible. So we're thinking about um, the optimal conditions of enzymes here in terms of temperature. So optimal in a human would be about 37-ish degrees. Optimal in this thermos aquaticus is 80 degrees. So you're going to try and figure out um, what works in what environment. So you'll have about four groups here. You'll actually have two different control groups um, because you will have your control groups at different temperatures. So you're going to do one in your human sort of thing. So you'll have... Um, your amylase with your starch in your 37 degree um, temperature. And obviously if that works, you know, and you get glucose from that, um, that'll tell you that it's a human. You will also have your amylase by itself at 37 degrees. That acts as a control because you don't want any glucose to come from that. Your thermos aquaticus, the same thing. You'll have your starch and your amylase at your 80 degrees. Again, if that works, you get glucose from there. You're thinking of your thermos aquaticus being from there. Um, you're also going to have your, another control group. You're going to have your starch at your 80 degrees. So you can see what I mean by two control groups there. Um, so your independent variable is essentially the temperature. Your um, dependent variable will be the breakdown of starch. So that kind of indication of the level of glucose there. Um, your controlled variable. So you'd think about um the amount of amylase that you're using the amount of starch that you're using that sort of thing um in terms of control variables in terms of your method you just kind of talk about what we talked about in terms of that setup so maybe you leave it for um 10 minutes and you check the glucose reading every two minutes perhaps um and you would repeat the experiment that's a sort of idea there. I don't know if I've missed anything, but you just follow this little step. Um, okay, maybe I'll leave you to have a go at this just based on the time. But um, a molecular biologist suggests that the binding of a specific hormone to muscle cells causes them to produce a much greater amount of a specific protein. Design an experiment that the biologist could undertake to determine if his hypothesis is supported. So your independent variable here would be the presence of the hormone so basically you'd have any specific hormone to muscle cells so you'd have um muscle cells and you would have some exposed to the hormone some not and you're measuring how much protein is produced so dependent variable is the amount of protein x that's produced your independent variable is basically the presence of this endomon and your control group is the muscle cells without endomon um you might use varying levels of endomon perhaps um but yeah, your control group would be, I'm oh, sorry, your controlled variables would be, um, you know, maybe the amount of muscle cells that you've got, the, um, you know, presence of other hormones you would want to minimize that, um, perhaps, yeah, that's kind of what you're thinking of there. Um, in terms of your method, kind of what we've talked about in terms, again, of that setup, you would just leave it for a couple of minutes measure the protein level think about how you might pressure the mo measure the protein level um perhaps with a little protein x detector i guess that's the most um specific thing to be using um and yeah you would repeat the experiment as well okay but again feel free to write that out and elaborate a little bit more on that um okay so these are some of the ethical principles in this study design bioethics are um emphasized a lot more than they have been in previous years um so integrity basically just being honest communicating all of the results even if they're bad justice ensuring that everyone is treated fairly ensuring that you know whatever you're researching like say it's a drug or something um it'll be accessible to like all people and you're not going to create this sort of unfair market really beneficence so beneficence and non-maleficence are sometimes confused 
Beneficence means doing the most good and non-maleficence means doing the least bad, basically. Um, so beneficence, you're always thinking about yeah, promoting benefits, always doing good. Um, and then non-maleficence, you're just wanting to avoid um, harm. You're wanting to not yeah, cause any um, negative consequences along the way, basically. And respect, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with respect. Um, okay, so approaches to certain bioethical issues. So they can be consequences based, duty based, or virtues based. Um, so consequences based basically means that the um, emphasis is placed on the outcome. So it doesn't matter what you did along the way, as long as the outcome is ethical, um, you know, that is what you did along the way, but as long as the outcome is ethical, that's where the most importance is placed. Um, duty based or rule based is basically this idea that whatever the outcome is, you have to be moral along your journey or, you know, be ethical along your journey. So that's the kind of, they're almost a little bit opposite duty based and consequences based. Um, and then virtues based is this idea of if you acted sort of morally, virtues based is kind of a bit like, like a bit random, but, um, yeah, consequences based as long as your outcome is ethical, that's your main focus. Duty based as long as along the way everyone's being treated ethically, that's the most important. And virtues based is as long as you acted really morally, that's where the most importance is. Again, this is very application based. Um, you likely get like some sort of scenario and then Bika will say, um, if you were to act in a virtues based, use a virtues based approach, what would this involve in that specific, you know, scenario or context? Um, okay. So a new drug to treat malaria is being trialed by scientists. To apply the concept of non-maleficence to their research, the scientists should ensure that what? So non-maleficence. Um, so any harm to the participant resulting from the trial is not disproportionate to the benefits obtained from using the new drug. Yep, that sounds pretty good. Data that shows the new drug is ineffective is not published. That would be um, to do with integrity and that would be breaching integrity. Consent is obtained from all of the participants in the trial. That's just, um, I guess, like respect informed consent, really. Um, the participants experience only the benefits of the trial. I'm also sort of beneficent in that way. Um, so precision medicine can be used to develop anti-cancer drugs that target and silence the gene or genes that cause a particular cancer. The government does not provide funding for many of these drugs and patients may need to spend upwards of 100,000 for one course when many courses of the treatment are likely to be needed to prolong life. This leads to unequal access to these life-saving drugs in society. Situation shows a lack of, hopefully you all said justice. Um, again, you had like seven sentences there or just less than. Um, you could literally just use the last sentence. This leads to unequal access to these life-saving drugs in society. You can answer the question just based off that. So again, be mindful of not getting too caught up um, in unnecessary or irrelevant information 